Welcome to a new segment where we talk about AI in a bit more depth. I'm Tom White. I'm a co-founder of a startup in the AI space, but I'm non-technical. So I always want to learn more. And I got my good friend and co-founder here, Elliot, to help explain a few concepts to me. Hey, I'm Elliot, the technical co-founder, background biomedical engineering, uh, deep in the world of AI. Uh, and we thought it'd be a bit of fun to dive into this, go through these sessions together. Uh, and hopefully for anyone else out there that wants to learn a little more, uh, you can follow along and hear about all things AI from Tom and us. This week, we're going to be talking about transformer models. We're going to run through what they are, the pros and cons, and then we're going to do a technical deep dive as well. And finally, we'll look forward to the future to see what is next for these type of models. Could you kick us off with a bit of an overview of what they do, how they work, just a high level for us? For sure. So transformers are probably like the hot topic in AI at the moment in terms of model architectures. They fall into this broad category of AI, which is sequence to sequence models which means that they take a sequence in, which is a number of things in a row. You can think of words in a sentence as a sequence. That's probably the most common application. Uh, and they output a sequence on the other side. They're hot news at the moment. You know, you may have heard of Hugging Face. That's a big company. Their whole business is really built around commercializing different transformer models. As we'll come to discuss, they've sort of spread out a lot more from their origins in, in text processing and now are being used for a lot of different AI applications. So where did these transformer models come from originally? So transformer models are the latest in the world of series to series uh, AI. They follow on from things like LSTM, the long short term memory uh, type architectures that were popular a few years ago. They have their origins in natural language processing or, or NLP. They are sort of the culmination of a couple of inventions. Uh, one of those and the main one being this idea of attention, uh, which we'll get into next, but that makes these algorithms a lot more powerful and a lot easier to train uh, and get good performance from without fine tune sort of parameter tweaking from the position of the AI developer. What makes these models useful and what makes them powerful? So these models, these transformer models, have shown really, really good results in a number of NLP tasks. So translation, categorization, document summary, uh, and more recently in a number of image-based tasks as well. Compared to some previous models like LSTM, uh, the attention module, which was starting to become popular in LSTMs as well as other uh, machine learning like convolutional neural nets, uh, has allowed these to be trained quite generically but then modified and fine-tuned for a number of different applications. So you'll see in you know, many of the modern, really big parameter space uh, neural networks, you know, GPT, DALI, that sort of thing, uh, there will be transformer pieces in there because they are so robust and so adaptable to a number of different problems. And what are the limitations of transformer models? So by their nature, transformer models are sequence to sequence, which means for them to be useful, they need to have a problem that can be categorized as a sequence. Now, originally, that was easy in fields like text. Uh, you can also think maybe of audio or you know, measuring daily temperatures, that sort of thing. That's uh, a natural sequence. Some of the limitations which are now being overcome is that traditional problems aren't always in sequence form. So if you have a picture of a cat and a dog and you want to try and classify it, you have to come up with an inventive way to take that picture of a cat, turn it into a sequence, and then predict a different sequence that can then be used as a label for that image. We've seen a lot of work over the last maybe three to five years changing problems into that problem domain. Uh, but if you have a brand new problem that doesn't have an existing sort of transformer setup, you do have to do that additional step of representing it as a sequence to sequence problem. So there's limitations of representing items as a sequence to sequence problem, but are there also limitations within sequences that might be more sporadic or might be less consistent? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Many of these uh, sequences that we get in there sort of what we call uniformly sampled, which means that, you know, every word is one word, one word, one word, one word, one word. You're not suddenly taking the first word, the 10th word, the 50th word. Uh, and for a lot of problems, that's okay. Some problems in, say, the health domain, which we work in quite extensively, that doesn't fit so well. Patients might, say, get their blood test. They might get it in January one year, get a follow-up test in April, then not get tested for three years. Uh, and without some clever engineering, we really can't just out of the box use sequence to sequence models there. There are some extra steps within these transformer models that take the data and couple it with uh, a second uh, piece of data, which is called a positional context or positional encoding. Uh, and that allows you to overcome some of this, but really, you know, if it's very sporadic data or sparsely sampled data, 
you're likely going to have to do some interpolation or, or some further steps to get it in a state where this type of model can be really useful. I've also heard that these models require a lot of training to get up and running. Is this a cold start problem of once it's up and running, we're fine with transformer models or every time you create a transformer model, do you have to start with a large amount of data? So you're, you're right in that they do need a lot of data. Uh, there's a lot of parameters to be tuned. But what we can benefit from is training these models on sort of broad data sets and broad problems and then fine tuning them for specific problems. So, you know, let's take Hugging Face as a, an example again. They have transformer model implementations that you could train from scratch, but you can also get a pre-trained model. So if you're doing a image to text or a text to image type problem, you can get one that's pre-trained on some quite large databases and then potentially use that to fine tune to the problem that you have at hand. So that's one way to get around the, the need for so much data. So let's jump into a little bit of the technical aspects of it. Um, a big concept within this seems to be attention. Could you explain that and what the innovation around attention is in this? It's, a, it's quite a complex topic, but I'll give you the high levels of what attention is. Neural networks and especially sequence models, they need some way of saying, okay, how does one thing relate to another thing? So words next to each other, how do they matter? Uh, and also, you know, words earlier in the sentence, how do they matter? Let me try and give you an example. If you put a, a negative at the start of a sentence, so if you say, nobody came to my birthday party and gave me a lot of presents, and so there's a lot of similarities in the way that you would train those models. Um, one thing, you know, in the, this is less in the text world, but more in, in other problems, is that these models often benefit from being able to be trained unsupervised as a form of pre-training. So what I mean by that is, you know, human language is quite well structured. Uh, and if you just have a number of sentences, let's say in English, uh, and you want to start to train these models to get a bit of an understanding of the English language, but don't have say, a classification data set ready to go, uh, you can do unsupervised learning. So what you might do in that case is you might randomly pick a word in the sentence and remove it, replace it with a sort of question mark, and train the model to try and predict what the missing word is. So it feeds in, you know, Let's take the sentence that I see here on my screen. What problem were they created to solve? Uh, you drop the word created, and then the model needs to try and replace that word created. Uh, and this has a lot of benefits in that, you know, we can take the huge amounts of publicly uh, available, unstructured, unlabeled data and use that to pre-train models. Recently, as people have adapted uh, transformers to image-based settings, we can now start to do that same sort of pre-training. Uh, which is becoming pretty powerful and really helpful to allow us to get a quite accurate model without as much labeled data as we previously needed. So let's look forward now. Are we just scratching the surface with these models or are they already peaked and we're eking everything we can from them? In the early days, there are a lot of applications that don't yet have transformer-based solutions and people are certainly working on that space. Um, they're, but they're being used in a lot of novel real-world applications from sort of text to image in the world of, say, Dali 2 and, and all of these other models uh, to translation, document summary, uh, and even some fields like, uh, you know, I guess, the more original sciences looking at chemicals as sequences uh, and trying to predict things uh, using transformers. Now, that being said, you know, transformers are the latest generation of these sequence-to-sequence -sequence models. I think there will be something next. You know, we see a lot of innovation in this space, coupling together things like attention and, and traditional sequence-to-sequence -sequence setups got us to transformers. And I have no doubt that somewhere out there, papers are being written that will one day come together to give us whatever comes after the transformer. Where would you like to see more exploration uh, by the community or by the research community in this space? I think, I think one area where these models are starting to see some interest, but I would like to see a lot more, you know, partially due to personal bias, uh, is in the world of sort of multitask reinforcement learning. So we saw the Gato model that came out of Google uh, that has a transformer at its core. It takes a sequence of real world events and then transforms them into a sequence of actions. Uh, and I think that's really cool. I think, you know, one of the really great things about transformers is they're sort of naive to what those sequences represent so they can be used in a lot of different places uh, and I think we'll see a lot of cool applications like that where if we can come up with clever ways to encode things as sequences and encode the answers we want as output sequences 
uh, these transformer models are likely to give us a lot of novel applications. So I think you know, really it's on the applied side uh, that I'm looking forward to seeing where transformers uh, really start to shine. Is there anything else you want to add that we haven't talked about today? What I would say is anybody out there that is looking, I guess, to get more of it hands-on with Transformers, definitely check out the Hugging Face Transformers library. Uh, we're not affiliated with Hugging Face in any way, uh, but it's very cool. It seems to be very well supported. There's a lot of community effort going on there. And because you can get a pre-trained model, uh, you can start to adapt it to your own needs very, very quickly. Uh, and you know, from experience, the best way to get a good feel about these models is either use them in practice or go get a machine learning PhD. And one of those is a lot easier than the other. Thanks for joining us for this episode. We'll be doing more like this. So if you have any suggestions, put them in the comment or hit us up on Twitter. Thanks and we'll see you next time.